This Week in Connecticut with Dennis House starts now. Welcome to This Week in Connecticut. Greetings, everyone. I'm Dennis House. We're entering the fourth week of Russia's war on Ukraine. We talked to the Connecticut lawmaker who heard firsthand the Ukrainian president's plea for help. Plus, a man who delivers babies wants to deliver an upset on Election Day. And hearing from women who lead our cities and towns during this Women's History Month. Also, big news about a farm-to-table restaurant looking to bring delicious food to the entire state and beyond. I see no sense in life if it cannot stop the death. But the American people will be steadfast in our support of the people of Ukraine in the face of Putin's immoral, unethical attacks on civilian populations. Be ready to defend every inch of NATO territory if Putin moves any further. You can have everything that you want. When, when I grew up, there was still a little bit of this sense that you couldn't be working and have children and a family. We need you. We need you because in Congress, it's only 24% women. Connecticut's at a crossroads right now to see where it's going to go. Economic growth has been poor, affecting families, affecting businesses. In your judgment, what has Congressman Larson done wrong? People really do care about their community. They care about where their food comes from. They care about what they're eating. We see the future as an opportunity where you have far the table, locally sourced food, where you have uh, quick service restaurants that are feeding good food to the community. First up on this week, the lead, the war in Ukraine closing in on the one month mark. As the Ukrainians refuse to stand down, there are signs the Russian invasion is stalling. While they haven't gained any ground, the Russians seem to be targeting civilians. As a result, three million people have fled their homes. Ukraine's President Vladimir Zelensky addressed a joint session of Congress on Wednesday and renewed calls for a no-fly zone over his country. He made his plea in English directly to President Biden. We are fighting for the values of Europe and the world, sacrificing our lives in the name of the future. That's why today the American people are helping not just Ukraine, but Europe and the world to keep the planet alive. I'm addressing the President Biden. You are the leader of the nation, of your great nation. I wish you to be the leader of the world. President Biden, though, once again denied Zelensky a no-fly zone, but he did pledge an extra $800 million in security aid for Ukraine. Joining us now from Washington is Senator Chris Murphy. Senator Murphy, thanks so much for being with us here today. Thanks for having me. You've been to Ukraine several times as you watch the videos that we're seeing and the developments there. What goes through your mind? This is heartbreaking. I mean, I've come to know, you know many of the leaders that people are watching on television, including President Zelensky, um, and, and knowing so many Ukrainian Americans in Connecticut who have family there who are fleeing the violence. It's devastating to watch Vladimir Putin um, devastate, um, commit war crimes inside Ukraine. Um, it commands us to action. So this is obviously a moment where we can't sit idly by. And I'm proud of the president for um, standing up and delivering substantial aid to allow Ukraine to defend itself, but also rallying the world to sanction Russia. Um, listen, I think we you know, might have been lulled into a sense of complacency in which we thought that the era of um, big nation war was over. Um, that is just simply not the case. And I think we have to be ready for other dictators and would-be dictators to learn lessons from Putin's failures and successes. Um, we've got to be ready for a turbulent next few years. If President Biden called you in and said, Senator Murphy, what else should we be doing? What would you tell him? I think we have to understand that you know the fight is both short term and long term. Um, and so I support all the president's measures in terms of getting uh, lethal assistance to the Ukrainians. And I'm glad that just last week he increased the amount of arms we're going to be sending to Ukraine, including, including more shoulder fired missiles and drones. Um, I've supported these sanctions on Russia. Um, but I think we have to understand that, you know, this is not the last place Putin's going to try something. And, you know, his arsenal of misinformation and propaganda, intimidation and bribery. Um, really can't be matched right now by the United States. We have the ability to match him militarily, 
but we don't have a way to match him on all of these other non-military tools. So I think we have to sort of plus up our ability to you know, help make countries around Russia energy independent, to be able to fight back against his propaganda, to really stand up for the rule of law in places that he's trying to undermine it. That, that all happens at the State Department, at USAID. I think we're going to have to increase military flows to NATO, but we're also going to have to have a bigger, bolder State Department to fight Putin everywhere. Which other countries do you think he will target? Uh, well, I'm, listen, I don't think you can um, rule out the possibility of Putin attacking a NATO country. Uh, I, I think a year ago, we would have never contemplated Putin um, coming into a NATO nation. But frankly, six months ago, we would have never contemplated that he was going to try to roll an army into Kiev. Uh, so that has to be a concern because that would be the United States at war with Russia. Um, I get really concerned about the Balkans. Um, you know, these are countries that used to be at war with each other, and Putin would love nothing more than for that part of the world, which has been interested in joining Europe and the United States in an alliance, to fall back into conflict. So countries like Serbia, Kosovo, Bosnia, these are places where Putin is actively uh, trying to seed um, conflict and destabilization, and we're gonna have to pay close attention. What is it gonna take to keep the United States out of this war? Well, I think the United States only gets into this war if it spills over into a NATO country. Biden has made it very clear, appropriately so, that we are going to supply Ukraine with the ability to defend itself, but we are not going to be in Ukraine with hundreds of thousands of American troops. And so far, the Ukrainian military, with our help, has shown a surprising uh, ability to be able to defend their country. Um, so we just get ready for a potential conflict with NATO. That means right now we're going to have to send tens of thousands of troops to the NATO border with Russia and be ready to defend every inch of NATO territory if Putin moves any further. Senator Chris Murphy in Washington for us today. Thank you so much for your insight and talking to us. Thanks, Dennis. Now, shifting gears to a local company that is about to go big. You see the name Farmer's Cow in the dairy section of your grocery store, but did you know they have a little restaurant that could perhaps one day be all over the country? Today, the story of a group of farms and their mission to help other small businesses in Connecticut and beyond. So, first time you saw the Farmer's Cow brand, what went through your mind? It was amazing to me because the fact that this has been here for so long and the legacy of the farm, the families, and the goodness of the opportunity to work with such great people, that's what I saw. Edwin Molina is an entrepreneur who has created companies and businesses. We met up at this farm in Franklin, the Cushman farm where 1,500 cows produce milk 24-7, 365 days a year, including Christmas. If someone says to you, what makes this product better than other milks and other ice creams, what do you tell them? I say it's the people. I say it's the, it's the brand. The brand is Farmer's Cow. Jim, tell me about Farmer's Cow. What is it? So Farmer's Cow is a group of six farms that got together. The six farms are the Cushman in Franklin, Fairview Farms in Woodstock, Fort Hill Farms in Thompson, Graywall Farms in Lebanon, High Tone Farm in Coventry, and Maple Leaf in Hebron. We decided to come up with our own cooperative called the Farmer's Cow and bottle the milk so that we could actually say, okay, you can buy or support our farms by buying the Farmer's Cow. These cows look just like the ones on the cartons. Tell me about these animals. So these are Holstein cows. You know, they give about 10 gallons of milk a day. They eat uh, forage, corn, and grass that we grow here uh, right around the farm. They sleep on mattresses uh, that are filled with shredded rubber for comfort. Um, so the cows here have a better life than other cows, is what you're saying, right? Well, they have, it's, it's, there's some aspects of that that are better for them, for sure, yeah. The milk these cows make ends up in cartons and jugs and also becomes ice cream and other products. Other farms produce eggs and they are sold all across the state and in some other states too. Not far from the six farms is the only farmer's cow store, the Calf and Creamery in Mansfield. Notice the spelling. Tell me about this place, how it came to be. Well, it's quite interesting, actually. We had been um, working with our milk and our eggs, and people were, were buying them. And one of the farmers, Ned Ellis, was like, you know, we need a place to, you know, we can have breakfast. 
And then they were saying, well, why not do a little more than breakfast? So that's when the Farmer's Cow Cafe and Creamery was born, that they decided, you know, we could use our ice cream, we could use our eggs, we could use our milk, and, and have it here for the public to come and enjoy. The restaurant also sells other local products like Hosmer's Soda, made in Wyndham, and products from other farms in Connecticut. It's part of the Farmer's Cow mission to maintain a small carbon footprint. They don't like to ship things in and would rather buy from a local vendor. So supporting this, you're supporting the products that the farmers produce, so the customer is also supporting their local communities and open space. It's that social consciousness and appeal of the product that caught the eye of Edwin Molina. I saw an opportunity to work with people that are trustworthy, that have a heart to serve people, have a heart to serve the community, have a heart to build into the community. Molina is helping Farmer's Cow to expand. Two bigger restaurants are planned for Avon and Waterford, maybe Glastonbury too. And then Farmer's Cow could offer franchises. We see the future as an opportunity where you have farm to table, locally sourced food, where you have uh, quick service, restaurants that are feeding good food to the community and the opportunity to build out in a sector that is amazingly growing out straight up. So you see Farmer's Cow nationwide? I see Farmer's Cow going out through New England and hopefully nationwide. Of course, the six original farms will need help and local farms across the country would supply the products for a Farmer's Cow, let's say in Rockford, Illinois, Wilmington, North Carolina, or Boise, Idaho. For Jim and Kathy Smith, brother and sister, the sixth generation to run their family farm, it's pretty exciting to think Farmer's Cow could be known coast to coast. It's amazing to think that it could grow, but that's what farming is about, growing things, right? Looking for the future and making the best better, so that's what we intend to do. Those farms are becoming somewhat of a rarity of sorts. They are disappearing to make way for shopping plazas and new homes. In 1975, there were 817 dairy farms in Connecticut. We're down now to about 90. So what is the future? Joining us now is the Commissioner of the Department of Agriculture, Brian Herbert. Commissioner Herbert, thanks for being with us today. Thank you, Dennis. Great to be here. So what exactly is happening to all the farms in our state? So it's really interesting. In Connecticut, we're seeing um, what we're seeing nationally with the number of farms um, plateauing or decreasing in some instances, but the value add, the interest from the consumer, the direct consumer is increasing. Um, and so that's a, that's a great opportunity that we are trying to help um, at the department level position the industry to respond to. Is it an economic question for many of these farmers? For example, it might just make more sense to sell it to a developer rather than keep the operation going? So, it, you know, our agricultural history and heritage is long and proud. Um, and Connecticut farmers are choosing, you know, what, what's the next generation look like? And so we are trying to work with them to make sure that they have a viable path forward. Um, and one of the ways we do that is work with them on our farmland preservation program, um, where we can actually purchase the development rights on their land so that they can keep that land and, and agriculture and production as it has been for generations and make it available to the next generation at a lower cost. What is the biggest product that farmers produce in our state? By dollars, uh, it's our dairy industry um, uh, and, and, and the total value added. Um, and raw sales, our nursery industry. You know, people forget that Cheshire, Connecticut is the greenhouse capital of Connecticut. Um, and there's a lot of uh, uh, flowers that are grown there and distributed across the Northeast. Commissioner Brian Herbert from the Department of Agriculture, thanks so much for your insight today. Thank you very much. During this Women's History Month, Connecticut's women in power gathered to highlight their achievements and discuss their future. Later, a candidate who delivers babies wants to deliver a, an upset to Congressman John Larson. Why he says it's time for a change in Washington when This Week in Connecticut returns.